Hi there, my name is Jeremy Krug and I'd like to welcome you back to another chemistry video. In this video, we're going to be learning about how to name ionic compounds. So we're going to basically start from a formula of an ionic compound and we're going to write the name from that. Now in the last video, we went in the other direction. We took names of ionic compounds and we wrote formulas for those. So in this video, we're going in the other direction. Now, just as a reminder, when we say ionic compounds, we're talking about compounds that have a cation and an anion. Very often that involves a metal and a nonmetal, or some cation from the ion chart and some polyatomic anion from the ion chart as well. Uh, on the other hand, if you see two nonmetals in a compound and nothing else, that's a covalent compound, sometimes called a molecular compound. And we name those using numerical prefixes like we learned earlier in this uh, video series. So mono, di, tri, tetra, those are some numeric prefixes that you might use in the case of a covalent or a molecular compound. So for example, if we have N2O4, we can look at that and see that it has two nonmetals. So it's a covalent compound, so we would name that using the prefixes di-nitrogen tetroxide. So that's how you'd name those covalent compounds. In this uh, video, we're focusing on ionic compounds. Now you might remember that in the last video, we said that to write the formulas of ionic compounds, we had several steps. In this process, there are fewer steps. It's basically just three steps. The first one is to split the formula into its cation and anion parts. Now, you can do that physically with your pencil, or you can just do that mentally if you prefer. The second step is to write the name of the cation, and the last step is to write the name of the anion, and that's basically all you have to do. So we're gonna do several examples of these together, and you'll see how to name ionic compounds. Hopefully, you'll be an expert on this by the time we get to the end of this video. So we'll start with this first example here, CaCl2. So once again, I'm going to split this in half. Most of the time, it's pretty obvious as to where these ionic compounds need to be split. Usually, it's right down the middle. If there's ever any doubt, I would personally split it right after the first metal that you see in the compound. So Ca is named calcium, so we'll write that down. And then the name of the Cl ion is chloride. And so that's the name of this compound, calcium chloride. We don't have to do anything with that too. There's no dye or any other prefix here. It's just calcium chloride. That's all you have to do for an ionic compound like this. Split it down the middle, name the cation, name the anion, and that's it. Here's another one, KNO3. So once again, we're gonna split it down the middle. If you're not sure, I always recommend splitting it right after the first metal. Now K has the name potassium, so we'll write that down. And then NO3 is a polyatomic ion that we had from our ion chart in the last video. NO3 is called nitrate. And so the name of this compound is potassium nitrate. By the way, if you need a copy of that ion chart so you can uh, see or learn those polyatomic ions, I have a copy of my PDF ion chart down in the description below. So you're welcome to use that. The, the next one I have here is NH4 in parentheses, two, and then SO4. So once again, I'm gonna split this in half and we'll name the first ion. NH4 is called ammonium. That's right off of the ion chart. And then SO4 is a polyatomic ion as well. And that's called sulfate. So we have ammonium sulfate. So if you know these ions, if you know the, the names of the ions, it's pretty simple to name these ionic compounds. Now, let's try another one, Rb2Cr2O7. Once again, I'm gonna split it right down the middle, just like that, and Rb has the name rubidium. That's an element we don't use all the time, but it, it certainly is on there. It's on the ion chart as well. Cr2O7 is a polyatomic ion, and we can look on the chart there and see that its name is dichromate, so rubidium, dichromate is the name of this uh, chemical compound here. Let's try another one, NH4Cl. 
So we might recognize that NH4 is a polyatomic ion. It's one of the very few cations that's a polyatomic ion. So we're going to split it right after the NH4. And that's, of course, called ammonium, like we said. And then Cl is chloride. So this compound is going to be ammonium chloride. Let's try another one. We have Ca, and then in parentheses MnO4, and then after the parentheses we have a 2. So once again, we can split this right down the middle here, and then Ca is going to be calcium, so we write that down, and then MnO4 is on the ion chart. It's a polyatomic ion with the name permanganate. So calcium permanganate is the name of this ionic compound. So we have several examples here. Now, it seems like this is pretty easy, I hope, if you've been following along here and you've been learning and seeing the names of these uh, polyatomic ions. There is one other little step that sometimes we have to do. There's an important rule. You might remember in the last video that we had some metals, mostly transition metals, that had a charge written in Roman numerals after the name of the metal, like iron 3 or titanium 2. Well, we have to be able to do that as we write the names of these compounds. There are some exceptions to that, not all the time, but most of the time you need to have the transition metals with their charge in parentheses as a Roman numeral. There are some exceptions, like I said, silver, zinc, and cadmium. These are transition metals, but they are always going to have the same charge. Silver, for example, is always plus one. So it would be redundant to say silver one, like silver one chloride or something. It's just silver because silver is always plus one. Same thing with zinc. Zinc is always plus two, so it's not necessary to say zinc two. And the same thing with cadmium. Cadmium is always plus two, so it's not necessary to say cadmium two. You see, these other transition metals need to have the charge written in Roman numerals in parentheses because those metals can have multiple possible charges. Iron is sometimes plus two, and sometimes it's plus three. So we have to differentiate between the type of iron that we're talking about. Is it iron 2 or iron 3? So that's why the Roman numeral has to be there for those elements. We have some other exceptions as well. We have a couple metals that are not transition metals, but do need to have Roman numerals in parentheses. Tin and lead, for example, if you look at those on the periodic table, they're not transition metals, but those can be either positive 2 or positive 4. So you do need to have a Roman numeral in parentheses for those elements. Likewise, antimony and bismuth, those are not transition metals either, but those can have different charges. Antimony and bismuth can be either plus 3 or plus 5, so you would need to differentiate and be specific as to what the charge is using a Roman numeral in parentheses. There are a couple others that are like this, but since this is a first year course, we're gonna to try to keep it to these and try to keep it fairly simple in these examples here. So we're gonna do a few examples with transition metals and see how we do with this. So we'll start with this formula here, Ti, and then NO3 in parentheses with a two. And of course, just like always, you want to split this down the middle. Uh, Ti is the symbol for titanium, and then NO3 is the formula for nitrate. It's a polyatomic ion. Now, we notice that titanium is a transition metal, and so we need to state what the charge of titanium is. And if you look at this, you can see that we've just swapped the charges. This 2 right here represents the charge that titanium has. So we basically just have to unswap the charges and realize that the titanium has a charge of plus two. And that two right there kind of gives it away. So that's why this is called titanium two nitrate. Now let's try this next one here. Fe2S3. Once again, we're going to split this down the middle here. And Fe is the symbol for iron. So we'll write iron here. And then S is the symbol for sulfide, so we have that. And we notice that iron is a transition metal, so we need to state the charge of iron using a Roman numeral in parentheses. And we basically have to unswap these charges here. It looks like 
The two that's shown right here is the charge of the sulfide. So the charge on iron has to be three. We just unswap those charges. So the formula is Fe2S3. The name is iron three sulfide for this one. Let's try another example, AgNO2. Once again, we just split this down the middle here. And Ag is the symbol for silver. And then NO2 is a polyatomic ion, and that's the formula for nitrite. So we'll write that down here, silver nitrite. Now we notice that silver is a transition metal, but we're not going to put a Roman numeral for this. And that's because silver is one of those exceptions. Silver, zinc, and cadmium are transition metals, but they don't need to have a Roman numeral. Silver is always plus one, so it's okay just to call this silver nitrite. Let's try another example. CS2O. So on this one, we're going to split it down the middle, as always. And CS is the symbol for cesium. And then O is the symbol for oxide. And that's the name, because cesium is always plus one. It's not a transition metal, and there's no need for a Roman numeral here. So cesium oxide is the name. PBBr4. Once again, we split this down the middle, and PB is the symbol for lead, and Br is the symbol for bromide. And we look at the periodic table and notice that even though lead is not a transition metal, it is one of those exceptions. It does need to have a Roman numeral in parentheses. And we can unswap the charges here and see this four right here and see that the lead has a charge of positive four. So this should be lead four bromide just like that, using the Roman numeral IV for four. Let's try another example. Here we have the formula P4O7. Now, as we look at this particular compound, we might notice that this is not ionic, is it? If you look at those two elements, phosphorus and oxygen, they're both nonmetals. They're on the right side of the periodic table. So this tells us that we don't need to be naming this compound using the ion chart and on all that, the, these ion names. In fact, we should be using numeric prefixes, just as we learned how to name molecular compounds back a couple of videos ago. So we see that P is the symbol for phosphorus, and there are four of those, so that's tetraphosphorus. And then O is oxygen and we're going to change that ending to IDE, so it's oxide, and there are seven of those, so that becomes heptoxide. So the answer is tetraphosphorus heptoxide for this formula right here. Let's try another one. Let's try SrCrO4. Now this compound is ionic. We have uh, the metal and we have the anion here. So once again, I'm going to split this down the middle right after the strontium. Sr, of course, is strontium. And then CrO4 is the polyatomic ion chromate. That's right off of the ion chart. So the answer for this one is strontium chromate. Strontium is not a transition metal. Uh, it doesn't... Uh, need to have any Roman numeral in parentheses. Strontium is always plus two. Let's go on to another example here. Let's try this formula, Cr2, and then in parentheses we have SO4 and three outside the parentheses. So once again, I'm gonna split this down the middle here. Cr is the symbol for chromium, so I'll write that down. And then we have SO4, which is a polyatomic ion. That's the formula for sulfate. So we have chromium and sulfate. Now we also notice that chromium is a transition metal, uh, and so we need to uh, figure out its charge. And we can do that fairly simply by unswapping the subscripts here. The two and the three can be unswapped, and we see that, that the chromium has a charge of positive three. So chromium three sulfate is the name for this compound right here. So that is uh, the answer. Let's try one more, and then we'll stop here. We'll have CUS. Now, once again, this is an ionic compound. We have a metal and a nonmetal. So I'm going to split this down the middle here. CU is the symbol for copper, so I'll write that down. And then S is the symbol for the sulfide ion. So we have copper and we have sulfide. Now, as I look at the periodic table, I notice that copper is a transition metal, so I need to have 
the uh, charge here on copper in Roman numerals and parentheses, but I notice that I don't have any subscripts to unswap, do I? Now, I might remember that whenever I don't have any subscripts like this, this tells me that the charges must have canceled out. And so if sulfide, we can look at our ion chart or look at the periodic table and realize that sulfide has a negative two charge, guess what? Copper must have been a positive two charge to make that cancel out. So that means this is copper two sulfide. So that might be a little bit more difficult, but I'm sure that you can figure that out based upon the fact that the charge is canceled out in that compound, in that formula there. Hey, I hope you learned something from this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you learned something, please smash that like button. I would really appreciate it. And uh, keep watching because in the next video, we're going to be addressing a very special type of chemical compound. And we'll learn how to write the names and formulas for those. And we're specifically talking about acids. So I hope to see you then. Thanks for watching.